one of the things that I particularly like about about those meetings is that it it's a nice balance of practitioners and um, academics, and the 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 conversations that come out of that are um, are often very heated and often very useful. Um, and the 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 merging of of sort of academic understanding of buildings and um, on the ground understanding of buildings is actually sort of the theme of of tonight's um, presentation. We've got three people who have worked on this really cool building uh, in one capacity or another. I had some uh, opportunity to work on it during its design phase, and then. Uh, Mike, is Mike, Michael, yeah, Mike, yeah. Mike, Michael Barnett, um, w was involved in a sort of retro commissioning. Why isn't this working the way it was supposed to project? And, uh, then we also have Thomas Kelly, who is the facilities manager, who is going to tell us how it's still not working. Right. So <laughs> anyway, um, my name is David Bradley in case I forgot to mention that. So. I just wanted to give you a little um, sort of brief overview of this building from an HVAC point of view. Um, the building was designed in sort of 2006, 2007, built in 2008 or thereabouts. Um, and this is an addition onto an existing historical building that was designed in, uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright. And as such, it has some rather, I mean, because it had to be in keeping with the historical building, there were a lot of design elements that did not lend itself, to lend themselves particularly well to energy efficiency. However, the congregation was really committed to energy efficiency. And so a lot of the, the design challenges of this building were, um, because of those, because of those two factors. So essentially the, the part that we're talking about consists of this auditorium, the balcony above there, the, that space that you came in through is called the lower crossing. And then there's some zones back there, a library. Um, and then there's, there's a, a sort of upper crossing. And then there's a, the over that away, there's a, um, a classroom wing. So these are the zones that I've, I've sort of drawn here. I, I do have some, if anybody wants them, um, I, I did some little handouts. I'll just, I'll pass them around. Don't feel like you have to take one. And if you wanna take one and make a paper airplane out of it, by all means, be my <laughs> guest. So many of these, uh, actually just noted an error on here. Um, many of these, zones with the exception of the classroom have a very unusual HVAC design. The thermal loads of these rooms are taken care of by a radiant floor. And when we were designing the building, we actually designed it to be a radiant heating floor and a radiant cooling floor. We had designed a building um, shortly before working on this one in about 2004, the Aldo Leopold Legacy Center building, which is up in Baraboo. And that one also uses a radiant heated and radiantly cooled floor. It, as uh, Tom and Mike will tell you, did not work out well here. It had worked out fine um, up in, up in Baraboo. And I'm intrigued to sort of think about why that might have been. But the idea was take care of the thermal loads um, with a radiant system because if, if you calculate out how much um, power you need in order to move a certain amount of energy, it turns out that it's way more efficient to move it around in water than it is to move it around in air. So we were trying to minimize the amount of air that we were going to have to move around through here also for acoustic reasons and things like that too. But so this zone and the upper crossing, the lower zones, which are the ones on the other side of the, the hallway out there, um, the balcony of uh, the auditorium, all of these essentially use a very, very minimal amount of outdoor air. 
the air handling for these is just the outdoor air requirements. And then all the thermal loading is taken care of by the radiant floor. The classroom wing, and the reason that I have an error on here is I drew a radiant floor in there because I was copying and pasting. Um, the classroom wing is much more of a traditional, um, a traditional system. It has an air handler, it takes some outside air, it has recirculated air, and there's no radiant floors in, in, those, in those zones. Um, all of the coils in the um, other two air handlers um, and these floors are all uh, heated or cooled by a single uh, water source heat pump that's on a geothermal field that sort of, I think there are 16 bores that sort of wend their way down the, down the parking lot that you all uh, drove in on. Um, as I said, the, the air handlers all use, um, uh, don't have any recirculation with the sort of semi exception of this air handler three, which takes some air back from up high in the balcony there and passes it across an ERV. I don't know if that's still in operation, but um, anyway, that was the design concept of the, of the, of the building. And one of the things that I will mention is, that was a big point of contention in the design phase was that we didn't think that this water source heat pump, which has, I think it has three different operating levels, three different operating capacities. We didn't think that that was a good idea. Essentially, we we're saying, well, what's going to happen is that under really low load circumstances, that thing is going to want to turn on and then it's going to turn right back off because it's not radiant floors don't aren't dumping enough energy under low load circumstances. And then the hot water is going to come right back to the heat pump and the heat pump's going to switch off. Um, and we had a suspicion that would happen because that precisely same thing happened at the Aldo Leopold Legacy Center. Um, and we'd solved the problem up there by putting a big tank in between big thermal storage tanks. So essentially the idea was there, it wasn't radiant floors at Aldo Leopold. It was um, radiators, just baseboard radiators. Um, but the same problem occurred under low load circumstances. The radiators weren't kicking off very much energy and the water came back to the heat pump hot and the heat pump said, whoa, can't do it. So we put in a thermal storage buffer tank. We ran the radiators off the buffer tank. And then when the buffer tank started to get cold, kick on the heat pump, heat up the buffer tank, all done. So we were begging um, to have a tank in here. And the folks who were the manufacturer's rep for the water source heat pump said, no, 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 you don't need it. You've got plenty of volume in the system. You're not going to need it. You're not going to need it. Um, I'm not sure this. So then we, then we started begging for them to at least leave enough room for the mechanical room to put in a tank once they realized that we were right. Um, <laughs> but uh, they didn't do that either. I don't think. So anyway, with that, does anybody have any questions? You want to talk about like some of the unique features, like the, the natural ventilation? Sure. And the, I'm not sure if there's any other kind of unique uh, strategies on the HVAC side. Well, that that one is um, that one's probably the most unique. I don't remember that there were any others really. But so you see these louvers that are along low in the wall here. There was a desire to have this this space particularly be naturally ventilated, but it doesn't lend itself well to natural ventilation. Even though it's got some nice height, which you need, it's very hemmed in on all sides by trees and other buildings and things. So there's there's there wasn't going to be much opportunity. Plus, there's a lot of unused volume. And the question was, well, how do you get natural ventilation that's going to behave itself and stay low here, but then also not make it stuffy for the people who are up in the balcony? So the idea that we came up with was sort of an assisted natural ventilation. So the idea is that there are these louvers low here, and then there are a bunch of exhaust fans high 
in the back there. And the idea was that under favorable circumstances, um, we could <laughs> turn on those exhaust fans, draw air in through these louvers, and sort of wash the room with natural ventilation. Um, and a concern we did not have, um, which hopefully will lead into something that, that uh, Mike and Tom are going to talk about, a concern we did not have was that condensation, it proved out to be a concern that we should have had, was that the radiantly cooled floors were going to cause condensation problems. So this was a concern that we had had on the Aldo Leopold building because that building was supposed to be really heavily naturally ventilated. And we were worried about, well, if you switch over from natural ventilation to mechanical cooling, you're gonna get a building full of moist air with a cold floor and it's gonna, you're gonna have a thunderstorm in your lobby or something. It appears that with the Aldo Leopold building, once the natural ventilation cut out and you started cooling down the floors, the floors took long enough to cool down that we could pretty easily dry out the air with the air handlers before there was a problem. I'll let you muck with that. Anyway, before there was a, a condensation problem. So they felt like they they did they the the, the people the occupants of that building um said you know we don't mop the floors when we're doing radiant cooling we wait for some other time to do that so that because they stay wet if they get wet but actual condensation and, and humidity problems didn't occur in that now i gather that the radiantly cooled floor in here was pretty quickly abandoned because it did create some humidity problems um, on the floor. Maybe that's a great transition to what you guys were going to say. Sure. Yeah. So, any other questions before we? Yeah. Yes. Um, question in the chat: um, Can you uh, just mention the relationship uh, between thermal capacitor, thermal buffer, and simulation time set? Wow. A very specific question. So the question is, can I can I talk about um, the relationship between thermal capacitance and simulation time step? And yes. So when if you've got a if you've got a, a an object that is not dense and it has what we call essentially low thermal capacitance. Okay, it's not dense and it has a high thermal conductivity and maybe a low specific heat. Okay, that thing can't store very much energy at all. So if you're going to characterize the way that thing behaves, and in simulation world, we discretize time. We take time and we bust it up into tiny little chunks and we pretend that nothing happens for this chunk and then it's steady for this chunk and then it's steady for that chunk. And that's how we build up our transient response. So if you have a building that has, or, or, or anything really, and you're trying to get an idea of its responsiveness and it has a low thermal capacitance, you've got to run with a very short time step so that you can see the transient. If you ran with say a, one hour time step and you have a building that is made out of paper walls, it's, you're not going to see anything interesting happening. Right. Whereas if you, we got approached some years ago to work on a building, it was actually the Sistine Chapel and that building has walls, which at the base are four meters thick. So there's some thermal capacitance there. You know, the, the temperature difference across those walls six months prior is what drives heat transfer at any given point in time. So in that case, we could have run with a good bit longer time step, I would guess. Um, was that the gist of the, the, of the question? Great. I had a similar question, just that did the size of a 
of the capacity of the heating and cooling systems in this project? Were they based on an energy analysis? Or were they based on were they based on an energy model or were they based on a traditional load calculation? I think that they were oh I'm sorry, yes. So the question is um, were the were the were the loads for this space based on energy modeling or were they based on more traditional methods of calculating loads? We came in to the project a little bit late and the loads had already been established. However, so I, I, I'm pretty sure that they were calculated based on traditional methods, which don't take into account thermal capacitance typically. However, in our early modeling, we were showing, we were seeing that those capacities were more than satisfactory to deal with the, the actual thermal capacitance. So when we, when we modeled the space, we were modeling its, its thermal capacitance. And to be honest, this building does not have a super high thermal capacitance. It's, it's, not, um, it's not particularly thermally massive. And then the follow-up question was, do we ever see those the water source heat pumps ever reach full peak capacity? Have you ever seen them? I have, I have some more information okay. on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions before we transition? I guess the floor is yours. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. All right. I think you're muted, but okay. I don't know. All right. I was thinking of the scene from. Uh, what was it, the naked gun where? All right, how's that, Lewis? Okay, great. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm just going to jump in here and um, talk about our experience with, I don't know, you could call it ret retro commissioning or troubleshooting or whatever you want. Real quick, I just want to go through the building operation and build off a little bit of what David was talking about. So there is a building automation system. It's an old the Allerton system. I don't think it's ever really been upgraded, and um, it works fine for for what we what we use it for. I think it was like fifteen thousand dollars to upgrade to the modern version. We're just like it's probably not worth it at this point. Okay, so um, as David was saying, this this space is served by um, the that ERV energy recovery ventilator, and um, care for this space and. It's actually, they got these like, uh, I don't know, underfloor distribution kind of swirl diffusers out the floor. It's kind of, I think it was intended to be kind of a displacement ventilation style system. And the return is, some of it's under the, um, the choir kind of bleachers over there. And there might be some in that back corner as well. And it's, it's served by the heat pump. So you could provide chilled water or hot water for the unit. And then there's an energy recovery wheel in that in that system and this was a lead building so this space was designed for the ashray's um 62.1 uh ventilation requirements which is like you know double wisconsin something like that um so this is the screen for the um the water distribution system so you have essentially um a distribution system that uses the same piping for the hot water, or the chilled water. It's all the mostly radiant floor, but then you have the few coils as well. And then um, this is just showing your, your multi-stack, which is heating or cooling only. 
and then you have your geothermal loop, and then your, your building loop. And I'll talk a bit more about that multi-stack in a few slides. AHU2, I think, is for the off for the classrooms. Is, is that right? Yeah, so not too much going on here. Um, one thing about this system, which I could talk more about later, is um, we don't have any reheat. So like the dehumidification in, in the summer is challenging. And then um, this system was for the kitchen. They have a kitchen back this way, and it had a big commercial hood. And uh, this system was designed to provide makeup air for that kitchen hood. And then EF6, I think, is another exhaust fan that serves over by the mechanical room, right? Is that, I think, right? Okay, so the, the primary reason I got involved in this project early on, uh, Tom, maybe you wanna just mention like uh, what, what you were seeing here in the, the classroom spaces. You uh, hear that, Lewis? Okay, yeah, just hold that up. So, so one of the things that we were seeing, we had our childcare room and two of our classrooms just overnight pretty much bloom with mold. And um, we had always had a, you know, we had always had some moisture problems in there and mostly it showed up around like uh, uh, outlet covers and that kind of thing. So, um, but this was, I don't really remember the circumstances of the weather, what the weather had been doing prior to that, but I mean, it really was just overnight. The entire ceiling was covered in mold. So, yeah. So that was the same time that our congregation member Mark was talking to Mike, but they were talking about other things. And I said, well, that's great. We can talk about efficiency, but how about this mold problem that I'm having? Let's talk about that first. So that is what we ended up doing. Yeah. So we, I came in and we tried to figure out how the building was supposed to operate. Cause it's a quite complex building, you know, for, when you think of like a congregation or a church, it's it's typically like a residential furnace and like super basic systems where this was basically like a Ferrari. And um, it was clear, you know, after 10 years had passed since the building was handed over that, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on that was uh, not recognizably wrong, but clearly creating issues. So we're trying to get to the bottom of what was going on. And um Let's see if I have a slide for this. So um, we found the building to be quite negative. It was like almost 0.01 inches negative. And um, what we found was that um, a bunch of the exhaust fans were basically running continuously, like the one that does the natural ventilation in here. The acoustics, they must have had an acoustical engineer on this job due to the auditorium space, but the fan was so quiet, like you couldn't even hear the thing. And it's back up in, in that room, up in the ceiling. And we found it's quite a large fan. I was a couple of thousand CFM and ended up finding that that thing was running all the time. So we got that figured out. And then um, EF6 that also serves on the, off the makeup air system was, was running. And after looking at the schedules and the sequences, we realized, okay, for the building to balance, like this fan has to be off as well. So we got that sorted out and uh, improved the building pressure. We made some tweaks on the ERV. We introduced more supplier than exhaust air and try to get the building a little bit positive because the classrooms over in this section are part of an, a previous project and the construction over there is a lot looser than, than this area. So all, the, all the, the air being brought in the building from that negative pressure was coming through the, those old classrooms. Uh, so once, once we got that figured out, then we could kind of focus on more of the stuff that Mark was interested in, which was mostly the energy efficiency and building performance aspects. And, um, we, we could walk around at the end of the presentation, but the multi-stack, it was basically version one of the multi-stack and, um, it was constant volume pumping on both sides of the heat pump. So the geo side and then the heating or cooling side. So it's a 15 horsepower pump for the, um, for the geothermal systems for a building this size, that's like an enormous, enormous load. So we, um, let's, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna advance here cause there's some more details to um, what Russell was talking about. So 
we looked at the multi-stack and, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of options there to, to reduce the pumping. Cause if we were going to pump less, we were going to trip the compressors off on like a, a high head pressure or something like that. So the, the, maybe the one redeeming quality of the original multi-stack was it would actually give you runtime and it would, it would um, give you buckets of how many compressors were running at, at any one time. And this is hard to see, but um, basically it had zero compressors running 67% of the time. So most of the time the thing was off, which goes to um, what David was, was talking to before about the, the cycle time. 19% uh, was one compressor, 13% two, and then 0.3% for three and 0.6% for four. So uh, we figured this 0.3 and 0.6, the, the unit was tripping off so much that when it came back online, th that was really the only time it would be running three or four compressors. Like, you might want to mention we instrumented the uh, the uh, current going into each of those units. So we we created charts showing that many times we we see short cycling, like five minutes on and then right off. With a lot of, with a lot of those units, and uh, so that was that on its own was was very interesting. Yeah. So I think a storage tank would would have done a lot of good for the system, but. I also think that a multi-stack, no one from Masters this year, the rep, but th that unit has been kind of a lemon, to be honest. But anyway, so so we worked with Masters, and um, all it took is these little discs and to isolate their. Um, what do you, I'm I'm blanking on the um, terminology on the fittings here. Um, yeah, it was those Vic the Victolic fittings, and um, we had a, a fitter come in, I think from General Heating, and we've essentially just isolated um, one of the modules. So there's two units, each with two compressors. And we just basically valved off a unit. And um, we added a drive to the, to the pump. So we added a VFD to the um, geo pump. And then we were using something like 9KW and it was running 24 seven. And then we fixed an issue with a relay that was uh, enabling the, the pump command on the geo pump so that when there was no compressors running, the pump would go off. And then we were running it at like half speed and it went down to like one and a half KW. So it was like six KW savings 24 seven. And it was like something like $5,000 a year in savings. And it was something like 30% of the building energy use was just from that, from that geo pump, which is crazy. Yeah. But before we uh, adopted the, the isolation of the two uh, heat pumps, uh, we had data from the prior winter showing worst case outside temperatures that, and the data from the unit showed that 99% uh, of the time, we only needed two to take care of the, the main heat load. Yeah, and we, so after that first winter on just one module, it was like, okay, well, it's fine. You know, we didn't have any issues. We made some changes. I, I think with the ERV, if I remember correctly, we added some logic for, um, we did add um, demand control ventilation in this space. And I think we added some sort of like a low limit on the, the air after the um, energy recovery wheel. So it would limit the fan speed. It would, it would limit the volume through the unit if we were um, getting below a certain temperature, but um, I don't think that's really been an issue. Yeah, so um, this is just a picture of the, the multi-stack and you could see the four scroll compressors, one, two, three, four. And then that's the tech from, from General when he was here doing those, those discs to isolate the unit. So I guess 2020 hindsight, here's, I guess, some of my thoughts about, about this building and it'd be, happy, it'd, be happy, it'd be great to have a discussion about some of these things, but um, I guess I could start with the radiant cooling. Uh, so they had a dew point sensor that they're using to reset the chilled water temperature up based on the, um, the space dew point. So I think that worked really well actually um, to avoid condensation on the floor because it didn't really seem like that was ever really an issue. It was, so the issue was more that the chilled water temperature would be like 
68 degrees. I think there's actually, I wonder if I have a slide here of that. Because th these pictures here are from a design day in the summer. Yeah. Okay. So like here we got, um, I think this comes out here. Yeah. Okay. So the, yeah. So the, the space dew points like 60 and a half. So then this temperature resets up like one degree greater than the dew point. So we, we ended up with like a 68 degree supply temp and it would just run, you know, it just run there all the time. And I don't think at that point is really doing much, but we're pumping all this fluid around. So the, the problem really that I saw was that there was no way to really do dehumidification in the space, like at part load. Like if you had the ERV going and you had a lot of people in here, you could actually, you know, turn over the air and be delivering dry air. But like 95% of the time, this building is at like super light um, load, like light capacity. It might just have a handful of people or like choir practice or like a small group meeting or something like that. But there was no way to dehumidify, you know, without turning on that ERV. So that, that was, that was a bit of a struggle. And, and, and was it, isn't the ERV getting water from the same loops? So the ERV would just be getting There is a, let me zoom out here. Um, the, it's a tertiary loop for the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the ERV, the question, the question was, um, if the ERV was getting that warm water, and, and my answer was what I, what I just mentioned about the the, the, um, the separate loop. So we would maintain that temp at um, at the ERV, but we didn't really want to run the ERV to do dehumidification. So I know Tom runs a dehumidifier back in the classrooms, you know, m most of the year. Um, if I had to do it different, I don't. I'd probably do some sort of dehumidifier. Use the geo geo water and um had just have like a some sort of dehumidifier little recirculating unit to help dry the space out uh, no there's um yeah I, I think you know that kiss principle i like keep it simple i think for this building like the the design team had these grand visions which I think we're really awesome. Like this building for the HVAC side of things, I think was like really far ahead of its time. It, it was all electric. It used the heat pump and the geothermal system. And like, these are buildings that are still like to the, to this day, like pretty cutting edge. And if you want to do a really high performance building, you typically are trying to do, especially in this, in this climate, you're doing heat pumps and geothermal. So I think the intent was good, but I think it was hard to pull off with such a small footprint and, um, not having like, you know, Tom is trying to do a million things with this building. He's got to get the room set up, you know, get, make sure that the snow's cleared, mow the lawn. It kind of takes like a building engineer to operate a complex building like this. So I think it could have been done maybe a bit simpler. Um, I mentioned about the second bullet up, um, there about having, um, more flexibility in the equipment operation. It seemed like it was like all or nothing. Like we could run the ERV or not. The floor, I really like the radiant floor for heating. I think it works pretty good. We keeps the building super comfortable and it just runs all the time. And I don't know, I, I think that's been a great investment. I talked about the summer dehumidification. And then the last note there actually is about the energy performance. So there's just one electric meter for this building and the um, original building. So there was really no way to validate the performance of the new building. And that's been kind of a struggle. Like I know there was three, three sections, it's the original building, the 64 edition, and then this edition. Yeah. Some old construction. So if you ask me like, what's the EUI of the new edition, I'd be like, well, I have no idea. Uh, even even just tonight, I wanted to bring like some energy data, and um, they have since added solar. I think what like a year ago or a year and a half, two years ago, they added uh, solar. November of nineteen, we went online. 
Yeah. That's what we did, right? So like that sounds right. Even like on the MGE website, because they have a parallel generation tariff, like I can't even look at any of the data. I don't know, it's kind of weird. Uh and then I tried to download uh, last year's energy data, but because MGE just switched over their um their billing system, like I could only go back to September. So Tom has the data and um I don't know. We we think the building between the solar and the kind of recommissioning stuff, I think it's like halved the energy usage. Is that Mark? I don't know I if you. Think, so we saved twenty five percent on our on our electric bills, right? Pretty much. Uh, that's that's from turning off the the controlling the fifteen horse motor. That we think that was costing us eight hundred a month, twenty four seven at high pressure. It was way up to the pump curve. Uh, and then uh, uh, other times we had added electronic controls to motors for the classrooms That's because right. the volume was producing so much noise. That was yeah. some noise that mm -hmm. turned it down. Yeah, so yeah. there were steps like that. Uh, uh, switching elect uh, lighting over to LED as, as we could. Uh, all of these things contributed to dropping our electric bill. How, and the, the uh, solar production uh, equals about 25% of our net need. Um, but the, the uh, solar is owned by an LLC and FUS buys the power from the LLC. So the, the carbon uh, footprint related to electric is cut in half, but the cost is only dropped by 25% from, from the utility. Yeah, so I I don't know if this really applies, but it's always fun just to put a random comic in a presentation. This is the one where it's, it has like, I'll just walk you through it. Uh, the, how the customer explained it. This is like a swing with three levels. How the project leader understood it. How the engineer designed it. How the programmer wrote it. How the sales executive described it. How the project was documented, which is actually in this case, not true. I think the documentation was pretty good. Uh, what operations, installed, how the customer was billed, it has like a roller coaster, uh, how the help desk supported it, and then what the, cu what the customer really needed was just, there you just got a tire on a, on a, on a limb, but anyway. Yeah, you gotta mentioned that uh, the first meter that was installed here was defective, only, it was only measuring, uh, you know, half of the power, Two th yeah, and, uh, we got a huge bill from MGE. &E. They finally came out here and said, "Oops, you know, this is a defective meter," and gave us a huge, huge bill. There was some negotiation; we got it reduced a bit, but that meant any kind of documenting of performance was was you know useless uh, in those early years. It looked great. So if you were if you were modeling, yeah, <laughs> on the, the, the power years, use then. was really way down. <laughs> it looked great. So. so Generally speaking, like not so much about the HVAC or the energy performance, but after almost 15 years or whatever of the, the addition being operating, like how does the congregation like architecturally, like the function of the space, like how has that gone? Are you guys happy with the, with what you have now or would you guys yeah, reduce? I think some generally things? people, we don't hear complaints about being too, too warm or too cold. I mean, you're the guy who would that. Yeah, no, I think again, generally people have good, a good experience here. Um, occasionally in the uh, summertime, it might get stuffy. There were times before we did some of the adjustments that we needed to do that it would get too stuffy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that we've got that figured out. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, for the most part in this space, it's been good back in those classrooms. So in the classrooms, we had uh, half of the classrooms were 1989 construction. And then the other half is the 2009 construction. So between those two, and that makes up a zone. So that zone has been challenging to keep comfortable. So if you'd ask those people, it would really depend on which classroom you were yeah, in. Yeah. If you were in classroom D or E, you probably were cold. Um, or if I adjusted it, you might be hot. And then it just, and all that, all that adjusting I had to do manually with the damper. So there was no, you know, automatic controls with that. So 
Do you want to talk about what happened with the natural ventilation? Like, why did that never really take hold? Like, what was the uh, limit, well, limiting factor? I mean, factor basically, what I'd say about that is that because, because probably mostly because of how we use the space, and then the few days a year that I could really agree that this is a good opportunity for natural ventilation. Um, those two, th- it just it just doesn't come up that often. So was it a manual sort of? Right, so you'd have to manually open up all those louvers and with like a crank or something. Yep. Or? Okay, well, flathead screwdriver. I think I was using. I, I mean, I really don't do it. So yeah, yeah. it's been a while. And I mean, the first time I did it, I thought it was a joke because it just seems so like unreasonable that we're going to do this. It's going to be sixty-eight degrees and you know low humidity for four hours this afternoon. So let's get some ventilation in here. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that seldom happens on a Sunday morning when you really need it. Um, and the same thing we have, we have operable windows in our half of our classrooms, uh, but not all of the classrooms. And so I kind of feel like a, just it's a commercial building, call it what it is. It's a yeah. commercial building and having operable windows in a building this size with so many different users doesn't really make sense. Yeah. You can't keep track of who's opening windows, who's who's closing the windows. Um, you know, it just it's that's hard to keep up with. Well, you might want to mention the uh, compressor shutting down for no obvious reasons. Uh, I, I, I mean, I know you've said when when there's a big change, a thermal change, or a seasonal change, then this can be a headache for Tom. Or he comes in and they shut down and. There's no obvious reason. Maybe it's the multi stacks uh, that are uh, not well controlled, uh, you know, internal systems, whatever. Yeah. Is. But this has been an ongoing headache. It's better now, but it's still not. Huge. Yeah. And that was one of my disappointments about, you know, we valved off one unit. And then I think we're actually pumping like still like at like 60% speed on the drive. So, I, I thought by over pumping the multi stack, we would start to lose some of those alarms, but it it didn't really happen. So um, and it's less. And the and the good thing is is that those um, wide fluctuations in temperature it doesn't happen that often throughout the year. Yeah. I mean, it's and um, and luckily, I mean, the building just tells you you walk through here. I mean, I can't go look and, and investigate every time, like look for alarms all the time. But yeah. during those times of year when the temperature is changing, I will watch it more often. Yeah, yeah. And um, and if I come in and it feels chilly, I know that it's been tripped. And if it's too warm, I know that it's been tripped. So usually it's just feeling it and saying, okay, yeah, something's not working right yeah, now. Yeah. So go fix it. Natural gas consumption. For this? No, we chose not to put gas in this part of the building. There. And then, of course, right after we opened, natural gas went way down in price. And so, trying to, to look at retrofitting that, we certainly spent a bunch of energy and time looking at whether or not that was feasible. But it just didn't make any sense. We have it coming in on the other side, and getting it here was, it just wasn't anything that was going to happen. It's, so natural gas prices this winter will be pretty high. So you guys should be saving money. I would say this this winter. It would have been nice to have the option, right? I mean, yeah. if we could have an option where you can, you know, do it when it's cheap and turn it off when it's expensive, that would have been nice. But yeah. we haven't had that luxury, so it's been all electric. Any other questions or comments or? We've been talking about the. Uh, are you uh, talking about the building integrated photovoltaics because this building has such a, a strong architectural statement that uh, like the like Tesla solar roof kind of a, a solar tile we can integrate into the building uh, envelope yeah I, I I could comment on this but I would say we've looked at a few like building integrated PV installations and I guess this building doesn't have that much 
southern exposure like you got a lot of the trees here on this side so the solar that they were able to do is pretty much restricted to the roof and is kind of conventional solar pv panels but yeah that's all I put because the rest is a green roof. So, yeah. And it's, it's pointed, it's tipping to the north. So. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. It's possible, but I think for this building, well, it was so early, it was 2007, so it wouldn't have really been an option then. But. Yeah, I think that was it. I, mean, I think this is on the marina. The marina was brought up. Yeah. David, do you want to comment on uh, the design versus the reality? Or... <laughs> this has been a, a, a pretty fascinating talk because I, I didn't know a lot of the, the um, sort of what had become of the design. I, I knew the building was here. I knew that the, the I had heard sort of through the grapevine that there were some issues with the multi-stack, which privately made me a little happy, but, um, <laughs> um, but no, this is, this is, this is really fascinating. I mean, we, we, I think as people who live in simulation world can get carried away sometimes with designs. I think Mike's comment that keeping things simple is advantageous in a lot of ways. Um, but in the, in the end, like, you know, getting to like a high performance building and implementing these new systems, like the owner was willing to kind of go where other people weren't willing to go. So in that sense, it is a bit of an experiment. And I think that's kind of the nature of improving technology and improving the building performance is like mistakes are going to be made. And it's not like there was like any villains or like evil people like behind the scenes trying to like sink the project. Like it was just the nature of what you know being on the cutting edge is i guess um, culturally this is a place that has sustainability is a value you know all, all those things are a value and, and being at the knowing that you're if you're designing geothermal you would know better but than me but in 2006 it's 15 years ago at this point right yeah you know, so yeah, the geothermal aspect of it i think was a pretty mature technology at that point but there are certainly a lot of other things that were not mature technologies and still aren't, to be honest. Cool, Radiantly cooled floors in the Midwest, not something that is going to ever become common practice, I think. Yeah, even trying to do like, um, we're doing a lab building and we're trying to convince the owner to do um, chilled beams and they're just like, we're not doing chilled beams. Yeah. And we're like, well, it's the, it's the lowest energy solution they're like we're not doing it so yeah it's it's hard to kind of make that leap sometimes uh, yeah, and i've really got it i mean i think the 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 community this this church's community uh, is to be commended for for trying something so innovative i think yeah for sure and um I don't know, you know, VRF has come a long way, but um, even still, I think about like trying to do VRF in this building. I don't know if it's really the right solution either. So um, yeah, I don't know. There's really, you know, as more and more people try to like decarbonize their buildings and do electric heat, not electric heat, but electrify heating essentially through heat pumps. In our office, we talk all the time, like about what is the ideal solution? I know that this building, right? Here, the, uh, what is it, like the UW Health Building right here? Oh, it's right across the street there. 800 U-Bay Drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The newer building oh. right here is um, VRF. And then, but even still, like on a design day, they have the penthouse that uh, with the condensing units with uh, gas heat, you know, tempering the, the um, air that's going into the condensing units. So it's, there's not really an ideal solution. And we, we really like geothermal, but again, it's quite expensive to build the field initially. So we're still kind of looking for that perfect uh, heat pump solution for Wisconsin. The, the architecture hasn't talked about much. <clears throat> Is there anything interesting? I mean, were there during design? Uh, I see a lot of glass here. 
So I must admit, I came in very late in the design process. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, uh, can, can we comment at all about the architectural um, aspects of the building? And unfortunately, I can't. We came in sort of after all the architecture had been, had been done. But I, I know that the architects felt, I mean, both excited to be, I, I think this is true of a lot of buildings that add to a historical a building of historical architectural significance. Um, and I know that the, the architect was both excited to be um, working on this auspicious building, um, but also felt somewhat constrained by having to match an architectural style particularly in this case, an architectural style that did not consider energy efficiency and sustainability in any way, shape, or form. So they did what they could to make up for the fact that this building they knew was just going to have to have a lot of glass in it. Thank you. So we were basically building an auditorium twice the size by trying to keep it from taking over that national historic landmark. So that was one of the constraints. Um, architecturally, well, so and we were also going for LEED certification. So I think that drove a lot of decisions. So that helped us decide to put a, a live roof on the building that's about 7,500 square feet up there. But at the time, I'm not LEED certified. Anybody who, who knows this would know maybe at the time. Uh, my understanding was that you'd get dinged if you had irrigation up there, um, which seems crazy to me. Would um, they have allowed you, do you think, to claim the moldy ceiling as a green roof? <laughs> Say that again? I was wondering if they allow you to claim that uh, moldy ceiling in oh, the, yeah, right. uh, as a green roof. <laughs> yes, it is very much so. Yes, no doubt. Um, so you know, I've had to look at retrofitting it to put irrigation up there, and the good the good thing is is that over these last ten years, I've only had to really go up there and water it twice. But it needs you know it needs about an inch of water every month between April and October. And so when it, like this summer, it started to get to a point where it's like, oh, I have to get up there. And basically we have, a, you know, old spigots that we attach garden hoses to and climb up on the roof and water the thing. That's what you got to do. So they're just planters up there. They're not very deep. And, um, and sedum that's up there. So it's pretty hardy. Um, you know, so that actually has performed well, but it would have been nice to have irrigation up there. And I think also the keeping the 1989 construction, um, I think that we should have just tore the whole thing down. But my again, my understanding, there was lead consideration in keeping part of that building. Um, and then I also joked that there were probably congregation members who were still paying their capital campaign donations for that <laughs> building. And so we needed to keep the thing up, right? But... I mean, it, it's it's a wall of windows, and it leaks like a sieve, and it's horribly insulated. So we're taking that, and then you would be able to talk about the modeling part of that, but combining that with new construction and trying to balance that and understand what the load is and all of that stuff. So I think we were probably asking a lot, keep this, but you know, design it like this, just like your thing you're talking about. <laughs> so... Project. It's a cool build. I, yeah, it's fun to be in here. It's a cool building. And Combining a bit very ambitious goals. Yeah, for sure. Should we go on the tour? Sure, yeah, for sure. Guess you got to leave the tour, Mike. All right, sounds good. Um, how much? How long a tour do we want here? Maybe like tw twenty minutes or something, or fifty. It's six thirty right now. So that's kind of the end of the normal presentation time. So.
I don't know. Maybe. Let's do like 15, 15 minutes or something. Um, You know what these guys want to see. So uh, yeah, I'll just go. I'll go to the mechanical room first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do you you operate it out of there now. The the computer. Or? It's kind of nice. It's just always going, and it's in the room, so you can hear stuff. So. Um, yeah, I'm not a great tour guide, but, um, so all this is the radiant heating, cooling, and then, um, we could maybe rotate people through the mechanical room and, um, what you're going to see in there, you could see from here that is the unit that serves the makeup, the makeup air for the kitchen. And that, that unit's basically been kind of abandoned in place, really. Like there's, there's really not much, uh, cooking that, that happens in this kitchen, which we was originally thought we were going to have a commercial kitchen and then we decided not to. So the hood fan was evidence that we were thinking about it, but then we decided not to follow through on it. And so on the days where we might have a lot going on here and a bunch of people making coffee and getting hot in there, we might run that. Yeah. It's still right. functional. Right. Um, and then it also up there gets hot or cold depending on what the season is. Yeah, yeah. Which all relates to that system. Uh, yeah. Does everybody know the uh, history of the original building because there's 10,000 feet of uh, hydraulic heating in, in the floor of the original building uh, completed in like 1950. So that's frankly right, light uh, hydraulic heating. So for every square foot up there, there's a foot of welded uh, Piping where there's like five zones and all these arrays, and they have no insulation in there. If you uh, open up the cement, which we've done over the weeks, uh, you'll just see crushed stone, and the piping was laid on top of it, and the cement poured on top of that. So each pipe is there with, with cement only covering about half of it. Um, and uh, over time, we've had to abandon some of the Zones. Uh, fortunately, not the main auditorium yet because the piping arrays are in the main floor, also in step areas. You know, everything, everything is piped. Um, we've had to replace the boilers and things like that. But, you know, so, that, that I think going with uh, the hydraulic heating here made sense because of our history as well. So, let me, before people rotate through, I think, let me just finish the kind of key tour locations and then people could kind of check out the rooms all at the same time. And then we could hang out in this area and answer any questions. Um, so we're going to walk towards the energy recovery unit and the, the classrooms. I heard the ox sensor go, but, oh, there you go. So this was, this was a, this is a new classroom, right? This is part of the new construction. Um, I don't think there's radiant in here, but uh, there, you do have the air distribution from the air handler. Uh, this is the unit that only has um, a cool, cooling only or heating only. These are two of the three classrooms that you could not carry each other as well in these rooms when we first opened until Mark helped us slow down the We paid for electronic control on the which is on 24-7. Yeah, yeah. And that rumbling that you hear was That's so right. much louder than it did, yeah. uh, especially get a couple of older people in here and then it was a session of what? Yeah, right, right. So I think on our list, we were going to convert this air handler to more of like a VAV air handler. It has a, it has the drive now, but what I'm talking about is like, um, you know, if there's low cooling demand, ramp it down to like 50, 40%. And then as the cooling demand increases, ramp it up. But 
um, at this point, we haven't done any of that programming. I don't think there's much savings there, but um, it's on the list. Because of the low usage, of relatively low hours. Yeah, and it's just a little, and it's already, it's just running at like, what does it run at now? Like 70%? Oh, we could look at it, but yeah. 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 Um, we could go, we'll go show you where the mold was coming in and then um, I'll show you the uh, ERV. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's running. So this is the ERV that for the auditorium. I don't know. It's not too much to see, really. I could really empty that team or twice a day in the summer. Yeah. It's not ideal. No, but you know, you just make a habit of it and you do it. The ceiling still looks good. I replaced most of it, but then we had the leaks. So oh, okay. Places I haven't replaced the tiles yet where the leaks were. I mostly because I want to make sure it doesn't really leak again. Yeah, yeah. So this was the original original construction. What year was is this? 1989. Yeah. So when when I came, all these tiles were kind of like bowed. They were so so damp, like you know, all the tiles were kind of bowing in and um i think the picture was taken at one of those um return at the return grills basically i think yeah. um have you popped up above to see if there's any obvious you know, daylight coming in the building envelope or anything you know well we've replaced the roof since then okay yeah so it was pretty bad i mean like when you get above ceiling you could just feel the air you could feel the draft like yeah. of the air getting sucked into the building it was really bad yeah, and we had uh, actually when I first started doing this, that we had some we had some out, outdoor uh, water, and uh, and when that pipe burst, um, when we took a look at it, it had been repaired so many times before that I just decided to abandon it. <laughs> it was just there's there was no insulation up there. So, um, is there anything else as far as the tour goes? I there's not much more really to look right, at right um the solar but you really can't see much unless it's light outside right so so i always forget how many panels we have up there is it 150 uh, well, it's 80, 80 two kilowatts rating. yeah is there a basement or is the ductwork concealed in the concrete floor? it's here i mean we're basically in the basement like then where when we're in the auditorium like we were, that's we're at ground level, right? There's, yeah. no, there's nothing underneath us. So. And like I, I think I remember trying to investigate um, the conditions in the in the ductwork because like all these are fed from under and like I was concerned maybe that we had water, you know, infiltrating into the underground ductwork and stuff, but um, we do have that in the nineteen sixty four. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had it coming in the ductwork and then coming back, flowing back into one of the uh, air handlers. And you know, you only you only replace the blower once, and because of that, before you figure out, we we haven't actually. That's all concrete as well, and we have not jacked up the floors to repair what's going on. So we just short stop the water coming in through the duct, and now it pours down into a. 30 gallon bucket and I slowly drain it down the down the drain. Do what you gotta do. <laughs> well yeah, it's if you saw where it was, it's a little, yeah, it'd be hard to yeah, it'd be a lot of buckets to carry out of that room. So here the subsoil is all sand. When they dug the large hole for the new addition, you know, you're looking down two stories and it's all this beautiful white sand. We're on a dune. We are, yeah. Glacial times. 
And that's helped protect the original building. All, all of the uh, sandstone uh, walls uh, have no cracks and there are no deep footings here. They, they put in these shallow, what they call Welsh footings and built the walls on top of that and, and yet everything's been very stable because the drainage is so effective. You know, anything that falls here goes right through the sand. Sounds good. If you guys want to rotate through and check out the multi-stack and what's going on in that room, you're welcome to do that. And then we'll probably hang out in the lobby if people have any other questions. But hopefully it was interesting. Yeah, great, great. I, uh,